All right. With that being said, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, would you grab a hold of them and open them up to 1 Samuel chapter 26? 1 Samuel 26 is where we're going to spend our time. We're actually going to do 1 Samuel 26 and 27. Two chapters today, okay? Uh, So if you have a Bible, open it up there. There are hardback black Bibles under every chair that you can use. uh, 1 Samuel is on page 249, so uh, you can find that there. You can open a phone or a tablet. Our online friends, we love you guys, uh, get you a Bible as well. 1 Samuel 26. As you are meeting me there, uh, you know, in church, we often talk about our sins uh, and what we need to do, like what we are supposed to do about our sin. But today, we're going to talk about kind of the the flip side of that coin. Uh, We're going to try to answer the question, what do you do when someone sins against you? Not when you sin against someone or when you sin against God, but when someone sins against you. And it's apropos that uh, Emily talked about sharing about forgiveness, because today we're going to talk about forgiveness. The topic of our sermon is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the thing we personally need the most. It is the thing that we get from our God But at the same time, it's something that God asks every one of his followers not only to receive, but also to give, to give forgiveness. Now, just by way of disclaimer, as we enter into this uh, this morning, uh, it's going to be really easy to think to yourself today, oh, yeah, yeah, forgiveness. Okay, this is good. Oh, man, I wish my mother-in-law were here. Oh man, I wish my husband was here. Oh man, I wish, it, I wish my next door neighbor, my friend was here to hear this. But listen to me, I'm not talking to any of them today, okay? I am talking to you. I'm not talking to the person who's sitting on your left or on your right, okay? So no nudging today. I saw that, all right? No nudging, no nudging. I'm talking to you today. This message, hear me, is only for people who've been hurt by people. Okay, it's only for people who've been hurt by people. So if you've never been hurt, well, good on you. Good for you. Okay, you're just going to have to sit here, enjoy your denial for the next 40 minutes. Okay, but but for the rest of us this morning, we're going to try and ask this question. How how do you forgive someone, especially when they do something that seems unforgivable? How do you forgive someone who sins against you? Because if anybody had an excuse not to forgive, it's David of Saul. That's, that's what we've been studying here in 1 Samuel. See, for years and years and years now, Saul, the king of Israel, has been doing wrong by David, the future king of Israel. I'll just run through the list, okay? Just, just if you're newer with us, let me catch you up on what's happened in 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, David comes into Saul's service. David was a shepherd boy. He is called into Saul's service to play the harp, to play soothing music for him, to help him with this evil spirit that Saul has, okay? In chapter 17, then David kills the Philistine warrior Goliath. That's a big deal. Uh, First Samuel chapter 17, he wins the favor of both Saul and all of Israel. And so, so David begins by serving Saul. He's on team Saul. Saul likes David at this point. But then in chapter 18, Saul gets envious of David's fame. He becomes envious and jealous. He tries to, at that point, kill David by hurling his spear at him twice two times, okay? Then he tries to get him killed in battle, a little underhanded, but instead Saul ends up killing 200 Philistines and he wins the hand of Saul's daughter. So he marries Michael, Saul's daughter. So now Saul is David's father-in-law and Saul decides, I'm gonna try and murder him again with a spear. And every father-in-law was like, yes, and amen. I understand this, right? (laughs) Listen, any of your sons come sniffing around my daughter, we're gonna have problems, okay? It's just how it goes, but... But in chapter 20, Saul's son, Jonathan, is now David's best friend. So David is married to Saul's daughter. He's best friends with Saul's son. And when Saul finds out that his son is best friends with David, he tries to kill his own son with that same spear just because of that friendship. So Jonathan warns David and David runs 
from Saul. And for the last number of chapters, it's been this cat and mouse chase going on here. In chapters 21 and 22, David runs to the priests at Nob. Then he runs to the Philistines in Gath. Then he runs to the Moabites. In chapter 23, Saul hunts David down in the wilderness of Ziph. In chapter 24, Saul hunts David down in the wilderness of En Gedi. And in 25, Saul, at the very end of what we covered last week, gives David's wife, wife Michael, he gives her to a another man and marries her off, which I'm not sure is legal, but that's what happens. When you're the king, you can do whatever you want. Today, that's where we step into. We come to the final chapter of this hunt. It's going to end today. So that's where we're going to pick up in chapter 26, starting in verse one. I'm not going to read every single verse. I will summarize some of this, but we're going to work through these chapters together. So look at verse one. Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakilah, which is on the, on the east of Jeshimon? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakilah, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. When he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Verse five, then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army. And Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. Okay, so this sets up our scene for these chapters. Saul's on the hunt again. This time he brings 3,000 men up against the 600 men that are with David. So it's a five to one odds in the favor of Saul. And David this time sends out spies to find out exactly where Saul and this army are encamped. And, and this is how it's, the text explains how they would set up the camp, okay? The king was in the center. We're not sure if they're in tents or they're just sleeping out in the open. But the king was in the center with Abner, his, you know, like chief commander, the commander of his army there. And then 3,000 soldiers just kind of spread out around him. So the king's in the center and all of his men are sleeping around him to protect the king in the center of this formation. Now look at verse 6. Then... David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, who will go down with me into the camp of Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So he asks two guys out of those 3,000. He's like, hey, well, who, who's coming down with me? We're going down to the camp. Who's, and one guy, Abishai, one dude is just like, let's go. I'm in. Two against 3,000. I like those odds, right? Which is my kind of guy. It's my kind of crazy, okay? This is my kind of, like, this this is who we like to hire at Fathom Church. Two on 3,000, we're taking it on, okay? It's wild. He's like, let's go, Abishai says. Verse seven. So David and Abishai, two dudes, went to the army by night. And there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head. And Abner and the army lay around him. Verse eight, then Abishai said to David, I think he's whispering at this point. I'm not gonna whisper it just because it sounds weird, but I think this is a whisper when you're surrounded by 3,000 other soldiers who wanna kill you, okay? God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now, please, let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear and I will not strike him twice. Okay. The text says that the spear is right above Saul's head. There's that spear again. Same spear. It's been used multiple times. Thrown at David thrice. Okay. Jonathan once. That spear is there and Abishai sees the spear and he's like, listen, David, I'm a pro. I'm a pro with a spear, okay? It will only take one stroke. I'll use his spear. I'll pin him to the earth. He won't even make a peep. You don't even have to worry about the other 2,999 people around here. I will. We're not going to wake up the rest of the army. We'll get out of here safely. It won't take two strikes. It'll take just 
One, how many times do you, you think you need to strike a dude with a spear to actually kill him? Seriously, I'd be mashing him like crazy. I mean, I, one strike, that's impressive without any noise. That's what's going on here. And I just wonder at this moment with Abishai, I wonder if David's tempted. I mean, he's just got to be a little bit tempted to take his revenge on Saul at this moment. But remember what we said a few weeks ago, right before Easter, in a similar situation. See, if David kills Saul, then David becomes Saul. That's what we said, okay? Saul has been hunting David for years now, but if David takes his revenge on Saul, he actually becomes the very person who is trying to destroy him. And then last week, Kyle preached uh, that, uh, about this foolish moment that David almost succumbs to. David almost kills this, this fool, Nabal, after being disrespected. He almost kills him and all of his sheep shearers. And then remember, if you rem- were here, Abigail, Nabal's wife, she, she's discerning, and she stops David from killing the fool, Nabal, and becoming a fool himself. So I just wonder at this moment... If David had succumbed to that foolishness, if he had become a fool himself last week, would he have been a little bit more trigger happy right here? Maybe. Well, let's look at what happens. Verse nine. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him. For who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, as the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him or his day will come to die or he will go down to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that is at his head and the jug of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head and they went away. No man saw it or knew it nor did, it, uh, did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. So it seems that David learned his lesson. He learned his lesson a few weeks ago when he spared Saul's life in the cave, and he certainly learned his lesson last week when he almost became a fool and yet decided to spare Nabal's life. And now in chapter 26, David makes a wise decision here. He doesn't kill Saul. And then he says something that's fascinating. Look at verse 10 again. He says this. He says, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go into battle and perish. So it's like God's going to take him out, which is how he killed Nabal last week. God just took his life from him. Or his day will come, like, or he's just going to die an old man at some point. Or he's going to go down into battle and perish. And it's a little foreshadowing as to what's coming in future chapters. But essentially, David's saying, hey, vengeance is not mine to enact. Vengeance is not mine. Vengeance is the Lord's. God is going to deal with Saul So David lets him go. And I personally think, I'll stand away from the Bible because you can uh, trust the Bible. You might not be able to trust me. Here's my personal opinion. I think this has been a test from God for David. And the reason why I think that is because in verse 12, we find out that the Lord has caused a deep sleep to fall upon this whole army. That's how none of those guys were roused when uh, Abishai gives him like a speech in the middle of the, like, that's not a stealth move, Abishai. You might be great with the spear, but shut it, right? But this deep sleep had fallen upon the men. It's actually the same word that we, uh, same Hebrew language that we find when uh, Adam is put into a deep sleep and God takes the rib and forms Eve. So it's that same idea, like deep enough so that you can do rib surgery. And I think this is a test to see if David would be a fool or whether he would be wise, if he would choose revenge or if he would choose forgiveness. And David chose not to take his revenge, but to forgive. Now, In verses 13 through 16, we're going to skip these. David calls out. They steal the spear and the jug of water. They run up to a hill. He calls out, and he calls not Saul. He calls Abner, the commander of the army, and he says, you didn't protect your king. What kind of man are you? Now, Abner is going to be a big, important character in David's life, but we won't really get there until 2 Samuel, okay? But then Saul pipes up when he hears David. Look at verse 17, 26 verse 17. Saul recognized David's voice and said, is this your voice, my son David? 
And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands. So so David once again pleads with Saul for reason. Be reasonable. I'm not here to raise my hand against you. He David continually tries to give Saul the benefit of the doubt and win him back with his words. Now look down at verse 21. After David speaks, then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. So Saul's response are, those are the right words. Those are the correct words to say. He admits his sin. I have sinned. That's actually the first time he said that. I've sinned against you. And he says, I'm not going to do any more harm to you. And then he even calls himself a fool. Again, hearkening back to last week's chapter about that pivotal moment of whether David would be the fool or Nabal would be the fool. Now Saul calls himself the fool. But David is, again, wise enough not to return with Saul. Saul's like, come come home with me. Come back with me. And And he knows, David knows, that Saul's words have not yet been accompanied by any sort of action that would evidence a change in his heart. So the text will say that David goes his way and Saul goes home. And hear me, this is the very last time that David and Saul will talk with one another. This is the end of their relationship. Now, look at chapter 27. I added chapter 27 into this sermon because I think it's a linking chapter between what we need to talk about next week and what happens this week. But in 27 verse 1, Then David said in his heart, now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. There's nothing better for me that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So so David, he he finally realizes this cat and mouse game, it's not going to end. It's not going to end. Saul will not be reconciled with me. We are at an impasse. And so he decides, I'm going to go to the Philistines. I'm going to go to Israel's enemy because that's the one place where he knows that Saul cannot and will not follow him. So he says, I'm going to go to the Philistines. That's what this chapter is about. Look down to verse four. And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. So yeah. That works. Look at verse seven. And the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. So he moves to the Philistine country for 16 months and he will fight with the Philistines, not against Israel, but against other neighboring rival tribes like the Canaanites. Uh, And that's what David will do for almost a year and a half, battling forces in the area. And then look at the very last verse, verse 12. And Achish, Achish is the king of the Philistines. Achish trusted David, thinking he has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore, he shall always be my servant. So Achish, the Philistine king, thinks he's got David on his side now. But it's only going to be a matter of time. And that really hinges us into what we're going to talk about next week. We won't get there today. So that's 26 and 27. That's chapters 26 and 27. And I want to use those chapters as a launching pad for us to talk about forgiveness. Let's talk about forgiveness from this passage. David forgives Saul of a seemingly unforgivable thing. Someone tries to kill you many times, that's about top of the list of things that you probably are going to have a hard time forgiving somebody for. It's going to be hard, but David forgives him. And forgiveness is one of the most important principles that every uh, Christ follower must understand. And and now hear me, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm not going to say everything that there is to say about forgiveness. Goodness gracious, there's no chance I could do that in a sermon, but I'm going to give us a bit of a primer on this. and, 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 And here's why. Forgiveness is unbelievably important. It's unbelievably important, 
and yet it is also incredibly nuanced. It's incredibly nuanced, and, and what that means is that there are a lot of goofy ideas floating around out there uh, that aren't true about forgiveness and that keep Christians from actually forgiving. There's a lot of goofy stuff out there in the church. And so we're going to look at three things. What forgiveness is not. Second, what forgiveness is. And then third, how we can begin to forgive. What it's not, what it is, and how we can start the journey of forgiving someone. So let's go on this. First, the first thing that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgive and forget is what some people say, and that couldn't be further from the truth. Forgiveness is not forgetting what happened to you. Okay, so when someone sins against you, when someone sins against you, when they hurt you very deeply and sin against you, now I I say sin against you intentionally, not just do something that offends you, but actually sins against you. Is the thing that was done against you a sin or did it merely offend you? All right, because, hear me, just because you get offended, it does not mean that you have been sinned against. Okay, people are getting all kind of offended about everything today. Lots of offense being taken, both personal offense and I can't believe you said that to that person online the third, you know, three years ago. Like, there's a lot of offense going on out there. And listen, if, if what the thing that offends you is sinful, then be offended. Be offended by it. But if that thing is not a sin, then, then here's lovingly what your pastor is going to tell you. Get over it. Get over it. And some of you are even offended by that. And that's the problem, okay? What I've just said is not a sin. I have not sinned against you by telling you to get over some things that you just need to get over and save me the email, okay? You don't need, I did not sin against you right now. Even if you're offended by what I'm saying. Even if you're offended. So save me those emails. But on the other hand of the other end of the spectrum where people get very offended, often one of the reasons why Christians have a hard time with forgiveness is because we just try to forget about the offense. We just try to pretend that it it didn't happen. We try to to make it a, a small deal. We try to kind of take it off of the big deal category. But now hear me, biblically, all sin is a big deal. Forgive and forget doesn't work because it diminishes and downplays what Christ did on the cross to cover sin, to take sin on himself, to deal with our sin. It downplays Jesus. So just note here in in our text, David doesn't just forget about what Saul does. Okay, sometimes people mistakenly think that forgiveness means you just let people off the hook. You just let people, like, like you're telling me you just let them get away with stuff? No, that's not what David did. David didn't let him get away with stuff. He grabbed that spear, he goes to a safe place, and he confronts him on it. So the saying, forgive and forget, that's dumb. Throw that one in the trash, okay? That's not forgiveness. It's not forgetting. The second thing that forgiveness is not, okay? Forgiveness is not restoration. It's not the same thing. It can lead there, but it doesn't always. There are people in my life who I have forgiven and our relationship has not been restored. Okay, see, sometimes people who uh, are forgiven for some action, they want things to go back to the way they used to be. But here's the truth. Forgiveness can let you start over, but it doesn't put you back to where you were. Forgiveness can let you start over, but it doesn't put you back to before the offense occurred. You can't actually go back. You know that? It's impossible. You cannot time travel back to before the sin occurred, before the wound occurred, before the hurt happened. It's impossible. To pretend that it is possible is crazy. 
please note that, that, that David does not go back with Saul. Saul asks him to, come back with me, my son. And he says, no, I'm going my own way. In fact, he flees to a place where Saul cannot and will not ever go. He gets out of there. And I just, you gotta hear me this. This, is, this feels sometimes anti-Christian, but it's not, okay? I promise you it's in the scriptures. You can forgive someone and still have very protective boundaries with them. You can forgive someone and not pursue restoration. Now, the forgiveness allows for you to pursue restoration, but it need not mean that. And I think people get hung up on forgiveness because they think, oh, that just means I've got to immediately welcome this person back into my life, which is not true. It's not true. I'm sure I could come up with more things that forgiveness is not, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just leave it at those two things. Forgiveness is not forgetting. Forgiveness is not restoration. It can lead there, but it's not the same thing. So with that said, let's, let's take a moment and ask what forgiveness actually is. Just to pair with those two things, I've got two things that forgiveness is. First, forgiveness is an ongoing commitment. It's a commitment. I say it's an ongoing commitment because it, it's not a one-time thing. Forgiveness isn't just like, well, I forgave her on Tuesday, so Wednesday I was fine. No, no, no. Forgiveness is an ongoing commitment, and I would say it is a commitment to three things. It's like a threefold commitment. First, it is a commitment not to bring up the offense in order to punish that person. Second, it's this ongoing commitment not to bring up that offense to other people in hopes that they will punish that first person. That's actually another sin. It's called gossip. So it's a commitment not to bring it up to that person to punish them. It's a commitment not to bring it up to other people in order to punish that person. And third, it's a commitment, an ongoing commitment, not to, to bring it up to yourself. Just hoping and mulling on and chewing on, man, someday they're going to get theirs. Someday, I hope there's justice. This, this will lead to resentment and and bitterness, and hear me, the third part is the hardest part. It's the hardest part. So it's this ongoing commitment. Forgiveness is this ongoing commitment. I'm not going to try and figure out how to get you back. I'm not going to try to punish you or equal things out. Nor am I going to like mind debate you for the next coming years, letting these things consume my waking thoughts. I'm not going to let you live rent-free in my brain. You do these things, you ever have these silent arguments that you always seem to win in your mind against the people that you need to forgive? Is that just me? Okay, it's just me. All right, fine. And listen, I don't, I don't want to make light of this. I don't know what, what's been done to you. I don't know how you've been hurt. But I just promise you that the longer you hold on to it, the longer you hold on to that bitterness, the longer you hold on to that anger, the longer you hold on to that desire for revenge. Like the longer you do that, the less free you are and the less fruitful you can be. See, I think David does all these things in these chapters. He does not strike Saul himself David killed Goliath with one stone. I'm guessing he could have picked up that spear and took and taken Saul out right then and there. He doesn't even let Abishai strike Saul. He doesn't let someone else do the punishment for him. In fact, when he addresses Saul, when he goes up onto that hill and he yells out to Abner and then Saul says, my son, he doesn't say, hey, you dirty old man, do you even know what you're doing to me? Do you have any idea the pain that you're causing me? trying to kill me, taking my wife away from me, giving it to you, you, you even understand what you're doing to me? He doesn't inflict that wound on Saul. In verse 17, Saul says, is that you, David, my son? And David says, 
my Lord, the King, it is I. He thinks respectfully of this deplorable man. I think in his heart, he's forgiven him. Now, again, I just want to note that David's not just letting Saul get away with this. We gotta be really clear there, okay? Notice that I said in all those three of those commitments, you commit not to bring it up to punish that person. That's the commitment. I'm not bringing it up to punish that person. It doesn't mean that you don't bring it up. In fact, it is very unloving and unkind and ungenerous and unchristian of you not to bring up when somebody sins against you. It's the opposite. It doesn't mean you don't bring it up to them, but your motives behind why you bring it up determine whether you've forgiven them or not. See, David's confronting Saul not to punish him. He's not trying to punish him. He's trying to reclaim him once again. We've seen this on repeat. He's trying to win him back. So he confronts him in the most loving way that somebody who has tried to kill you multiple times could ever do. And hear me, this is applicable for us. If you confront someone out of love, they might change. If you confront somebody that has sinned against you in love, they might hear you and change. But if you can confront somebody out of vindictiveness, listen, they'll never change. They'll always see straight through that. They'll know it's revenge. They'll know it's it's from a place of anger and, and evil even. Forgiveness is an ongoing commitment. It's a commitment. You have to commit to it. It's a commitment, and that means that it is granted before it's felt. It's granted before it's felt. Here's another hang-up I talk with people all the time about when it comes to forgiveness. Hear me. If you think forgiving someone means that you like them, you can forgive someone and not like them. You hear me on that? If you think that forgiving someone means that you have warm and fuzzy feelings towards them, if you think that, you will never be able to forgive. You'll never be able to forgive because hear me, if they have truly sinned against you, it feels bad. That's what sin does. And now also hear me on this. You can't control how you feel. You ever wake up on just like a random day and feel awful? Not like, oh, my stomach, but like, I just woke up on, quote, the wrong side of the bed. Anybody? Marcy? No? Okay. (laughs) You can't, listen, listen, you can't control how you feel. You ever try to will yourself into a good mood? Good luck, right? (laughs) Right? Like, you can't control, listen, This is the most profound thing I'll say today. Feelings are. They just are. They they don't exist. It's not that they don't exist. It's not that they aren't an important thing to note, but they just are. They just are. You can't can't really even trust them. You can't even really trust them because they just are in constant flux. While you can't control your feelings, listen, You can control your actions. You will not be held accountable for your feelings. You will be held accountable for your actions. I cannot control how the thing that you did to me deeply affects me to the core of my being, but I can control what I do in response to it. And it's amazing. It's amazing, but but over time... Not overnight, but over time, if you make the commitment to forgive, God will often, not always, we've already covered this, but but God will often change your feelings towards a person. The feelings, listen, they're always the caboose, and the engine is your, your commitment to forgive. The engine is the commitment to forgive. So forgiveness is an ongoing commitment. Second, the only other thing I have time for. Second, forgiveness is costly. 
It's costly. Uh, when you commit to forgive someone, it's costly. It hurts. It just does. Every, every, hear me, every single time you decide to forgive someone and you commit not to keep bringing it up, it hurts. It hurts you. You know why? It's because you are paying the debt instead of making that other person pay it. Okay, illustration. Uh, if I lend you my truck, which I will not, <laughs> right? but if I did, this is in the hypothetical world. If I lent you my truck and you wrecked it, which is why I won't, okay? <laughs> but if I lend you my truck and you wreck it, there are only two things that can happen. Only two. Either you pay for it, or I say, I forgive you and I pay for it. And don't, you know, I know some of you lawyers are like, ah, what about uh, insurance? You pay for insurance, y'all. You don't think they're jacking your rates up? You lending your car to some dummy that wrecks it, right? Like, no, that's, this is how it works. It's either they pay for it or I pay for it. Like, just magically forgiving someone does not fix my truck. It's still all damaged. It's still all broken and busted up. Forgiveness is me saying, I'll pay for it. Me forgiving you isn't me making you pay for it. Me forgiving you is saying, I will take the debt on myself. And that's why it's an ongoing commitment. Because even after I fix that truck, I'll walk out to it and I'll see that color match that's just not quite right. And I'll be tempted to be angry and think in my head of ways to get you. Don't tell me you wouldn't do the same thing. It's an ongoing commitment, even after the truck's fixed. Even after the debt is paid, you have to keep forgiving. And this is why it's costly, because it hurts. Because it hurts. Think about what this cost David to forgive Saul, to let him go again. I mean, this is crazy costly. Uh, Abishai must have thought, David, you're nuts. You're completely nuts. Saul wasn't just after David here. Remember when he killed the priests at Nob for assisting David? He killed the whole town? What do you think he's going to do to the 599 soldiers who are with David if he captures David? He would have killed every single one of them. Abishai could have said, David, you are putting all of us in unnecessary risk right now. That's the cost. David was paying a high cost, an incredibly high cost, it made to, to the point where he is so vulnerable that he has to become a refugee. He has to flee to enemy territory in order to get this guy to stop chasing him. Forgiveness is always costly, you guys. You either make them pay or you pay, but somebody got to pay. Okay, so if we're talking Old Testament, like we're, that's where we're at. We're in 1 Samuel. In this day and age, in the Old Testament, there are really only three choices when somebody wrongs you, culturally. There's three choices. One, you can pursue retaliation. Two, you can seek retribution. Or three, you can extend forgiveness. Want to bet which one never got practiced? It's the forgiveness thing. It never happened. And listen, retaliation was the main motto of ancient peoples. That's how you dealt with things. You make them pay. You talk about me bad, I kill you. You poke out my eye, I kill you. You kill my dog, I kill you. You kill my cat, I mean, that's all right, you know. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's called retaliation. It's called retaliation. That's how the world functioned right now, that, right then. Uh, then Moses comes along. Moses brings God's law, and he says, hey, no more retaliation. Old Testament law says retribution is the new way we do things. So it's eye for an eye, okay? Tooth for a tooth. Life for a life. You do to others as they have done to you. You don't, you don't level up in your retaliation. You look for retribution. 
But that's what makes what David do, does here so unbelievably incredible. He does not retaliate. He could have. He doesn't even seek retribution. Instead, he chooses to forgive. And he takes the debt on himself. And we see it because he doesn't get to go home. He has to flee. So y'all, let's land the plane with this. How do I even start to forgive? How, Pastor, you've, you've convinced me. You've convinced me that forgiveness is, is a good thing. How do I even begin? Because listen, it's not very hard to say nothing and just boil inside. It's really not that hard. It's called being passive. It's actually not that hard to just boil over and let someone have it. And depending on your Enneagram number, whether you think that's demonic or not, okay, depending on that, you're going to choose one or the other. You're going to be trigger happy and boil over, or you're going to hide it and suppress it and try to run from those feelings. But how do you even begin to do the hard work of forgiving? Well, I'm glad you asked. That's why I had 1 Corinthians chapter 6 read over us this morning. So I want to read it again. I'll put it on the screen. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That list is meant to make all of us feel like, uh uh-oh, don't pick out one. Look at the whole breadth of the list and be like, "Uh uh-oh, verse 11. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Listen, if you want to forgive people, how do you start you have to remember who you were. You start by remembering. Such were some of you, but you were washed. Church, this is the first step towards forgiveness. It's to remember how much you have been forgiven of. Forgiven of. Listen, before you can commit to forgive and before you can pay the cost of forgiveness, you need to remember that you are in the position of one who has been forgiven. I think that's the only way to start. I think it's the only way that you'll ever have the spiritual vitality to commit ongoingly to forgive someone who has done something unforgivable to you and to take that cost upon yourself time and time and time again you got to remember. And that's the main point for us this morning. Those who experience the freedom of forgiveness extend forgiveness. Or you've heard this before, I'll say it again. Forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive people. So I want to end with this. Um, It's the million-dollar question. Some of you are going to need to do a lot of work on this. Some of you knew... The moment I said we were talking about forgiveness, here's the question. Who do you need to forgive? Some of you have been suppressing. Some of you was a long time ago, and so you've got to actually probably do some work. Some of you, the thought of them makes you sick. Who is it that you need to forgive? Is it your dad? Because he left because he abused. Because he, he was supposed to show you that you're fearfully and wonderfully made. But he only criticized. Is it your mom? Because she manipulates. She's so passive aggressive. Maybe, listen, maybe you just can't stand that she knew what your dad was doing and said nothing. Is it your kids? I'm not talking about like your nine-year-old. 
okay? But listen, if you've got grown kids, I mean, you did everything that you could to raise those babies right. And you think, man, when I took you home from the hospital, I thought to myself, I would give my life for you. And now they won't even call. Maybe you need to forgive them. Maybe it's a friend. And you were, man, you were so tight. You did everything together. And then you found out what they were saying behind your back. And you're like, listen, that's it. It's over. We're never going to be friends again. Maybe it's an ex, an ex-husband, an ex-wife, and because they promised at that altar, you were there, they said for better or for worse, and then something worse happened or someone who they thought was better showed up and they were out. You need to maybe forgive them. Listen, if you're holding on to any unforgiveness, if you are unwilling to take these steps to forgive, don't you realize what it's doing to you? Unforgiveness is cancer. It just takes over from the inside out. But forgiven people forgive people. And so I'm not saying what was done to you wasn't awful. In fact, it was, listen, big or small, it was so awful that Jesus had to die for it. It was so bad that you needed a substitute, a savior, a reconciler. But you get to decide what now you do with that forgiveness. Forgiven people forgive people. And if you've stood at the, the cross of Christ and you've experienced his forgiveness freely given to you, then hear me, he, if Jesus makes this abundantly clear in the New Testament, then you will forgive he prays it, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us. So you, Christian, will forgive others because they deserve it? Certainly not. That's not why you forgive. Did I deserve Christ's forgiveness when he died on the cross? Well, don't they have to ask for it? I don't remember God asking you if you needed his son to die for you in your place to take care of those wrongs. No, he moved to you first by first sending his son to die for you. So listen, if you are in Christ, you gotta remember that there was a day where you bowed before Jesus begging his forgiveness. And he gave it to you, no questions asked. Forgiven people forgive people. God help us. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you today. This is a tough topic. It's a difficult thing to talk about, let alone walk out in this life. And it's really hard, God, because of sin. Sin is what separates us not only from you, but from one another. And Lord, I have sinned against those in this room and, and they have sinned against me in different times and in different ways. But this is part of the broken state of humanity. We sin against one another. And yet, Father, you model for us in what your son did for us a way that we might even begin to practice those things when we are wronged. Biblical forgiveness is the way to life. Biblical forgiveness is a way to freedom. Biblical forgiveness is the way to fruitfulness. And so, Father, because you have fully and freely and forever forgiven us, we pray that we would live as forgiven people and extend that same forgiveness elsewhere. This is hard. We need help. Not just even from you, Holy Spirit. We need help from one another. Help us help each other to forgive. So Holy Spirit, do the good work in our hearts, transform us and change us that we may be more like David and not like Saul. So we pray these things, Father, in the name of Jesus and by the power 
of the Holy Spirit. Amen.